You're listening to the 95 Podcast from the team at 95 Network, where we host conversations specifically designed to support leaders in small and mid-sized churches. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the 95 Podcast. I'm Dale Sellers, Executive Director at 95 Network. And as we begin the new year, I wanted to put together a, a group or a panel of experts in the small church space. And I couldn't find any greater experts around America or the world than the guys that I have with me today. Uh, they're all part of the 95 Network team. <laughs> uh, we we want to talk today specifically about an article that came out uh, by Tom Rainer uh, in late uh, November of last year talking about the small, the size of churches and what is a small church, what is a large church. We'll dive into that in just a minute. But for just a second, I want to introduce our guests with you today, and and many of them have been on the podcast before. Uh, I've got uh, Jason Allison and then Greg Moore and John Sanders and Brent Carter. So take a moment, guys, and kind of tell us where you're at uh, and uh, what you're doing, and uh, and then we'll kind of dive into it. Start with you, Jason. Sure. I'm uh, Jason Allison. I'm uh, pastor at a at a local church here just north of Columbus, Ohio. Uh, the church is a two-year-old church plant with a couple of mergers involved. Uh, I'm also part-time with our uh, denominational affiliation, Converge, uh, the Mid-Atlantic region, where I'm the director of church strengthening. Oh, that sounds so important. Are you, are you really important? <laughs> no, I'm not that important. <laughs> and then we most have importantly, uh-huh. most importantly, I am on the 95 network team. Oh, yes, that's that's most important to us. <laughs> and, and then we have Greg Moore. Greg, where are you located and what are you doing? Hi, Dale. I'm Greg Moore, uh, located in the Indianapolis, Indiana area, where it's getting a little bit cold and rainy here today. Uh, I just retired uh, a year ago from a church where I was executive pastor for seven years. I've been in ministry for 20, was in the automotive industry for 20 years before that. And now I just want to help churches working with uh, chemistry staffing, doing some church consulting. And then, uh, as was just said, with 95 Network, helping churches with vision casting. So That's awesome. John Sanders is in the coldest place of our team. <laughs> Yeah, I'm in Antarctica. No, I'm just <laughs> north of Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Feels like Antarctica sometimes, but uh, I've been a rural church planter for many years. Uh, also have served pastors through a couple different podcast platforms that I've been a part of over the years. And I also get to serve as the director of coaching here for 95 Network. So I love the church. I love pastors and I love serving them through some powerful conversations. And last but not least, we have Brent Carter with us. Brent, where are you and what are you doing? <laughs> well, I'm going to start off and try to get some brownie points by saying serving with the 95 Network for first and foremost. <laughs> uh, but uh, oh, I've been in ministry for over over 20 years, uh, working with both church plants and existing churches from uh, small churches all the way to to very large churches. Um, I uh, served kind of within the space of business and church with Logos Bible Software for about seven years, uh, but the Lord saw fit to put me in a different role with the Gospel Coalition as their uh, manager of partnerships. And that's kind of what's keeping me busy these days. And of course, uh, you know, helping out with kind of some local church ministry stuff um, in regards to a ministry uh, that my wife and I are launching. Uh, But excited to be here and, and chop this up with you guys this morning. Well, I'm glad to have all of you here. This was this was just an interesting article that came out, and it and it caused uh, a lot of reaction. Uh, uh, Tom Rainer put out, and so I'm just going to read a couple of things he said to kind of set the set the uh, the table for us today. It, it, and and this is based on Lifeway research, and it says that uh, it says what is a large church? And let's look at a breakdown of churches by an average of worship attendance. And it says under 50 attenders is now 31 percent of all churches. From 51 to 99 attenders is 37% of all churches. Uh, from 100 to 249 is 24% of all churches. And then uh, 250 attenders and above is 8% of all churches. And so uh, the point uh, of the article was that, that w- the way we have defined what the size of a church is uh, has changed. Now, I want to go ahead and say up front, it, you know, some people are like, well, why are you even talking about that? You know, size, you know, why not church sizes and numbers and stuff? Well, I think it helps us to understand how to relate to uh, uh, the, the community around us and how to minister uh, to folks around us. And 
And so the, you know, the, if you have a, a very small church, there's things you can and cannot do uh, that a church much larger can and cannot do. And so uh, I think that's why we want to have this conversation today. Uh, it says in church answers, it will speak to the churches with the following categories. So this is his, uh, I think it's his blog he does. He says that under 50, per, uh, under 50 in attendance are considered to be smaller churches. Uh, 51 to 99 are now mid-sized churches. Uh, 100 to 249 are large churches, and then anything over 250 is now a is 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 called a, a larger church. Um, what do you guys think about that? <laughs> what when you hear those numbers, you know, Jason, how does that impact you? Well, I mean, on some levels, we've been saying a lot of this for years, even yeah. before the pandemic. Uh, I I was trying to find numbers to see you know, like, can we break this down any further, you know, to find, I can't find any research that's up to date yet. Um, I, I, some of this just really honestly, isn't that new. And I, I think just the, the stark reality of the pandemic in the last three years of everything has just made people really aware that honestly, churches, churches are made up of, you know, smaller congregations than the big sexy ones that make the news. Absolutely. You know, uh, 95 Network's name comes from the fact that we, you know, uh, and this is documented research that happened years ago, that 95% of all churches are under 200, are under 500 in attendance. And, and so, you know, whether it's 500, 250, none of that stuff matters. Uh, but there there has been a shift in, in the church. John, are you seeing that? Yeah, absolutely. For me, one of the biggest implications when I read this article, I, I ran to my resume and updated it to say that I've now pastored one of the largest <laughs> churches in the United States. So that's pretty cool to get to say that. But no, <clears throat> for me, I think this ought to take pressure off of pastors who mm -hmm. for far too long <clears throat> have been chasing this dream of numbers, numbers, numbers. And, you know, we see what's happening on a, a big church level. Nothing wrong with that. We love our big brothers in the mega church, but like 8%, and that's not even mega, that's 250 or more yeah. make up that 8%. So, you know, I, to me, it just pastor takes some pressure off and, and to realize if you're leading a small church, there's not something wrong with you. Your church is not broken. Your church is very normative. And yep. I, I think that's a big takeaway from this. How about you, Brent? What did you think when you first saw this? I, I felt like it was a call for the church to tell the truth in regards <laughs> to American evangelicalism, because we're, we're all saying that this is nothing new. Yet the reality is, when you look at those numbers, oftentimes, you know, I mean, I'll, I'll pick on Baptists for a little bit. You look at churches that had, you know, a membership role showing 450 people on their membership role, when we all knew that on an average weekly attendance, they were averaging 50 to 75, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and, and the reason I think that this matters is when we actually stop and take a look at the effectiveness of that church, and you have to look at the numbers, right? How many people are being baptized in your church? How effective is the nurture and care of discipleship at your church? Is there actually discipleship at your church? And quite often, the numbers are just kind of an indicator of, you know, the the deeper disease. Well, I think Brent just set the table. <laughs> Because it's exactly true, man. You know, and see that again. The thing is, is uh, uh, number numbers can can or cannot show health. You know, it it can be a kind of thing that that you can use as a gauge or not use as a gauge. But but it's not about just how many people are attending. It's about what we want to help you with at ninety five network is being more effective. Greg, what did you think when you first saw all this? Um, I, a little differently, actually. I was a little more surprised, I guess, than some of you guys. Um, just cause I read the Christian standard magazine a lot and, you know, they would say up to 499 is a medium church and then 500 to 99 was large. So that was kind of ingrained in my head, uh, with that, but I do agree with the fact that these are probably, uh, more realistic when you think about 95 network and 8% of the churches being considered large. So, um, but again, going back to what was just said too, is I think the implications are really the important part of it. Well, we're not going to change the name to 92% network. I mean, it's just locked in. We're going to keep, and, and you know, and numbers are all flexing. I do, I do believe this is true. You know, whatever, whatever the averages were before the pandemic, I think it's true. Uh, and we've consistently seen this number that, that the majority of churches have lost 30% of what they had before the pandemic for whatever reason, and, and you know what, we could spend all day talking about that, but 
Uh, and so it, what we wanted to kind of focus on today with this, with this thought is how does this affect pastors? How does this make things better? Or does it make it worse? What does it affect us at all? Uh, and, and talk something about the, you know, just the psyche of what's going on with most pastors. The, some of the, here's what uh, he said later in the article. He said, here, here are some of the implications. Uh, and, and, and you guys can pick out your favorite one of these. It, it, the first one was that more pastors and staff will be co-vocational or bivocational. Uh, the second thing he said was equipping church members to do the work of the ministry will be as vital as always. Uh, the third thing he said was that ministry theology, uh, ministry and theology training must adapt to this reality. The next thing he said was that search committees will be looking for a different type of pastor. Um, and then the next thing he said was that church budgets will be smaller. Uh, and then a couple, couple more denominations must refocus their ministry and support of the new paradigm. And then the last thing he says that more churches will need to, uh, to be, uh, uh, more, more churches will need to be adopted or they will die. Anything that stick out to you, Jason, when you, when you hear those things? Um, I, well, I mean, the first thing that sticks out to me is as I look back at the, the, the vision box uh, that 95 network does, you, you just listed things that we've been, we said previously, you yeah. know, those are the growth engines that matter, equipping the saints to do the ministry Ephesians four, that, that, that has, hasn't changed no matter what attendance is that hasn't changed um and, and some of the others the the whole co-vocational bivocational um you know john that is your <laughs> that's your your bailiwick I'm, I'm sure not gonna dive into those waters um because you're that's your area but i i'm seeing it more and more in the people that i am running into and i've sent a lot of people to john's uh stuff because it's so important that the church isn't the only pay that a pastor gets and I, honestly, I think a lot of this is that, you know, the culture in America is changing. It, it's not so much that anything's good, bad. It's just different. It's different. And, and so, and the church, it really isn't changing with that. And so we're not connecting with the culture in the same way. Um, and, and people with little or no connection to the church before the pandemic now have zero connection to the church. Mm. The people who had connection relational connection stuff like that they came back now they're not coming as as often as they used to yeah uh you know instead of four times a month they're coming two times a month or whatever but in all that i i think we've got to understand that the culture is changing so we have to shift the way we think about what it means to do church absolutely you know one of the things that we're doing uh we've we launched and, and it's been amazing the amount of these that we've set up but uh we're, we're doing a new soul care essentials conference and one of the pieces in there we talk about your professional life and i spent a good bit of time in that section talking about this whole thing of being bivocational john was the first guy to kind of uh, pioneer this for us within 95 network and has a ministry that that deals with it john kind of dive into your you know you've been doing entree pastors for over a year now and and what you're seeing and feeling uh, kind of you know what is the implications of this for you yeah well first of all i didn't like invent co-vocational or bivocational ministry i want to be real clear on that that's nothing new off? under the sun either <laughs> I thought you did so that. No, don't give me credit for that. But here's what Entree Pastors is all about. Like we launched a podcast and do some coaching around this. This is not this idea of a pastor trudging off to go trade his hours for dollars in the marketplace, kind of begrudgingly so that he can afford to do his, you know, support his pastoring habit. Um, this is about teaching pastors to embrace being in the marketplace, to be excited about it. You know, when when in this article, Tom Rayner mentions church budgets will be smaller, they weren't awesome to begin with. And if, right. if that's true, that church yeah. budgets are getting cut even more and a pastor's quote unquote full time salary of forty five thousand dollars a year is going to be cut even more. This is high time for pastors to quit feeling guilty about being out in the marketplace to embrace it. Turns out there's actually a lot of unsaved people who need Jesus out in the marketplace. Oh there's a lot of reasons we're excited to get pastors out there um, where the earning potential, that ceiling is removed, that otherwise is very much in place on the pastoral side of things. So, you know, we 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 really create an environment that encourages and supports pastors to celebrate this and not view it as this you have to do this in order to be able to afford to be a pastor. And if that, by the way, if that means that some of your focus and attention 
on the church is diminished a little bit. We also think that's a good thing because of some of these other things like Jason just mentioned. You know, it forces that issue of equipping the saints for works of ministry, which seems pretty biblical anyway, that this was never designed to be one guy doing all the work while the rest of the consumers come and watch and consume. Like, so we love this on many levels, having pastors out in the marketplace. I don't see this as bad news. I'm excited about it. Brent, you seem to be agreeing. What are you thinking? Oh, my word. Um, you know, I think one of the things uh, in the article that really stuck out to me that is really resonating, John, with what you just said, is it, it's going to change the paradigm to where the pastor is no longer the silver bullet. Getting the exciting youth pastor in that is supposed to fix, you know, why the young people don't come, you know, it, it's going to have to shift all of that paradigm. Uh, I'm talking to, you know, a lot of churches right now, one church in particular, they're struggling like you wouldn't believe to find a pastor. Their pastor, he was in his 40s, decided to head back out into the marketplace and, and left the church. And of course, they're trying to find what they've always known. And the reality is, um, that's just not, that, that is not going to get anybody excited to show up, and, you know, as, as the savior uh, for their church. So that's going away. And the reality is, when it comes to pastors being able to take care of their families, and they're going back out into the marketplace and seeing all these incredible opportunities um, to not have to sacrifice their family's financial future for the sake of ministry, um, I think I... I see a lot of guys, not not just that I think, that I know, that are getting excited about doing that. Um, and I think one of the most exciting things for the church, if we look at this as an exciting time, is, you know, one, I, I kind of feel like it's it's like this Gideon effect uh, to where it's win winnowing away uh, those that are not really prepared for the fight. Um, the show is is going away because now it was, we, we weren't doing a good job faking the show before. Now, a lot of churches, they can't even do the show, even if they wanted to try to fake it, <laughs> right? Yep. So it, then it's taking them to a place of, well, what are really the important factors that our church within this community are supposed to be doing? And, and I'll be quiet after this. I have a dear uh, friend in Atlanta. He took over a dying church. Um, and he's, you know, he, he's a, a very visionary kind of guy and there was no way he was going to give up his day job, uh, of what doing what he, what he, what he's doing. Cause he loves it. And he's come in, removed all, you know, the, the aspects of the show and stripped it down and their membership is actually increasing because it's actually ministry that matters now mm -hmm. instead of church that just happens. Wow. Greg, he said in the article that search committees are going to be looking for a different kind of pastor. What did that mean to you? Yeah, and I thought that's one of the areas I kind of want to focus on that and the theological part of it. To me, what it, should, what it said to me was, I think about church planting or site startup, they're going to need a type of pastor who can go in there and, as we talked about, develop disciples that can do that ministry. You know, I was in a church that was a startup and there was one pastor and we needed all the people, the laity, to come alongside and do a lot of the work. Right. So as we, we've talked about that. But I think theologically and when it comes to the training, it's going to have to change. So I'll just say something that people might find a little heretical is that when I got my MDiv, I had four uh, semesters of Greek and four of Hebrew. And I look back on that and I say, as a small group pastor, that did not help me. <laughs> it would have been better for me to have time discipling people, learning about discipleship, learning how to develop leaders, all those different things. And I think to me, that's one of the things that has to change in our seminaries is how do we, yeah, we got to teach people to preach, right? And they need the background to do that. But there's so many programs out there today that you can get Greek and Hebrew from and, you know, and take your 500 words that maybe you memorize in each of them and forget them because I did in a couple semesters. But um, but I think if we can teach people to disciple and develop leaders, that's going to be the really important part. I talk about this all the time. John, why do you think seminaries just seem, cannot see our Christian training just doesn't seem to get this or make this transition? You're asking me that question? Yeah. The guy that spent five years getting an associate's <laughs> degree, learning how to put out fires. You're asking me that question, Dale. Yeah, well, what do you think I have that? no idea, man. Academia is just a different animal. And I'm coming from a place that is not, you know, I didn't, I'm not bashing it, but I didn't go that route. I, yeah. in the early years of my ministry, it felt uh, like a huge source of insecurity that I didn't have that degree and that formal training. And what God showed me in that season was he didn't need me to be 
qualified at a seminary level. He needed me to be obedient and willing, and he could show the world what he can do through a surrendered life and heart. So, I mean, it has its place for sure. I, and there's times I still wish I would have gotten some of that higher level of learning. Uh, for me personally, it pushed me though to become a voracious reader and seek mentors because I recognize, man, I need to grow. I need to be developed. Uh, I just didn't go that route. But I don't know, man, like to me, academia always seems to be a little bit behind um, where things are at in the in the real world to some extent. Also, I mean, just in this information age in which we live, the whole dynamic has been turned on its head. It used to be you had to go to a physical place that held the knowledge. They they had the libraries and the books and the resources. And man, the Internet has just blown all of that up. Yeah. And again, academia being what it is, has been very slow to recognize that and and pivot and and find new and innovative ways to train people more practically. So again, I just feel like it's kind of an older, large organization that's hard to turn around, you know? So that's the best I can do, Dale. One of these other guys can speak to that more powerfully than me, for sure. Jason, oh. Jason, dive into that one. Well, I, I, so I do have a, a, a degree and a couple of degrees, whatever. And, you know, like Greg said, you know, that and $2.95 will buy you a cup of coffee at Starbucks. You know, I just... I, it's not always that helpful. There are parts of it that really have served me well, and I'm I'm really glad I got that. Um, I, to me, it's it's I think it's Dallas Willard that said, um, you know, your your systems are perfectly to design designed to give you the results that you're getting. Well, the 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 systems that we have designed through academia, through the the seminaries and so forth, is basically discipleship in the tech in the context of a large gathering, like we, we you know. We try to, the modern method is to gather this mass group and try to disciple them in a mass gathering. And that's supposed to attract more people. Uh, but I think it's pretty obvious that that system or that result is not happening, that it's mass gatherings are not leading to mass discipleship because the moment there was any tension or difficulty, they left, <laughs> you know, they, because they, there was nothing attracting them. There was nothing holding them there. Um, I think the question is whether we are willing to acknowledge this as the church and then try to develop a new paradigm of church moving forward. Like, I, I don't I don't think the fact that local churches, according to these statistics, are getting smaller. I don't think that's a problem to be solved. I think it's really a reality that we need to now adapt our paradigm of doing church within a different context. Brent, dive in. I can see your wheels yeah. turning. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I spent a lot of time um, working with a lot of your major seminaries across North America. Um, and, you know, the, the first thing, I, I think they produce what they're producing because that's what the church has asked them to do. Um, I, sometimes I feel like there's this tension of they've kind of built this machine and the church is just responding to it. When I actually think it's the opposite. Um, they're producing what the church has asked them to produce. Um, and we look at the church in North America and we see the state that it's in. Um, and then we look at the seminaries and the seminaries are saying, but this is what you've asked us to do. Mm -hmm. Now, the reality is this, I, I definitely think seminaries for sure have their place in regards to creating a, a standard of ac academic rigor. Um, that definitely one helps in the pulpit because in, you know, and this is, you know, just anecdotally, I, I feel as if in some ways the church is weak because the pulpit is weak um, and you can't teach what you don't know. And we have a lot of that going on, um, you know, so, so from that standpoint, I do see some, there, there are some new seminaries out there. I won't drop their name and name plug them because they didn't pay the 95 network for that advertising. Amen. But, <laughs> but there are some movements out there that are realizing that one, um, how they're bringing theological education to the church here in North America, it cannot be from the perspective of, hey, this is just for the professional Christians. Um, the rest of you guys just sit back in your seat and they'll share with you the important bits. But there are some movements out there that are saying we need to be geared towards actually equipping and training the entirety of the church from the pew to the pulpit. Um, it is a slow move, but I am seeing um, I am seeing a move there uh, that that without technology, it, it just wouldn't it wouldn't be what it what it will be here in the future. Yeah. Um, but I will. But I do think that there are going to be a number of seminaries that are going to make a dramatic shift to reach the pew 
um, systematically to bring a higher standard of theological knowledge and education. It's so good. We're going to take a short break and we come back. I want to shift this thing and talk a little bit about the uh, the psyche, emotion, whatever you want to call it, of, of what's going on inside pastors uh, in light of these numbers. So take a short break. We'll be right back. We're back here with our team from 95 Network, just talking through an article that came out by Tom Rayner back in the fall, just talking about how the, we we are, are relabeling what the size of a church is. And really none of that matters. What we want to do is we want to talk about how does this affect how a pastor feels about himself. You guys know I wrote a book a few years ago called Stalled, and it, and it just described that I felt like a failure as a pastor. Because the model that had been set for me of success was the large church. You know, if, if you didn't have a church of thousands, you were not successful as a minister you know, or I was a leader. And, and, I, and you know, and, and, and there are a lot of reasons why I got there. But I do believe today we live in the residue of the seeker and the attractional movements. So when you think about this, uh, what we've been talking about today, Jason, how do you think it affects our, our uh, uh, the psyche, our emotion, if you will, of the pastor, especially now that we're in this this side of the pandemic? I, I mean, I think I think pastors are just they're a little confused, it, yeah. it, like, OK, what am I supposed to be doing? What are the expectations? What does what does success there you look go. like? And, and, and to me, that that's where. Yeah, we. I just feel like we're at this stage of we are rethinking everything, and so that's always a scary time because you know people want to know what what's the expectation. How do I know when I'm winning? Mm-hmm. How do I know when I'm doing things right? And we look around now. We we don't have answers to that yet, and and that so that I feel like the pastors that I'm working with and talking with they're at that stage of going, we're still here, we're in, <laughs> we're willing to adapt, but we don't know what we're adapting to. And and so it's, there's just that weird state of, we don't know what's next. And that really kind of scares us. I believe we're personally, and I've been saying this for a while, and it's on several of the podcasts, but I believe that we're in the midst of a reformation. I literally believe that how the church in America and maybe even around the world, but specifically in America, how it has, how it is being uh, uh, implemented, what we're doing, what the, what the goals are, all that's changed. And what I've seen personally over the fall of 2022 uh, is a lot of pastors who just absolutely don't know what to do, you know? And so I want to throw this question to all of you. You, you set it up, Jason. Uh, and I'll start with you, John. John, w- w- looking forward, how would you describe what is success for a pastor in ministry? Well, you know, Dale, I come back to what I said earlier about if I could just write a prescription to pastors that just relieves so much of this pressure they're feeling, um, I-, I would do it right now. Yeah. But I'm telling you where that pressure comes from. When you are under this very traditional model that we've been, you know, we've inherited, it's been very much a part of our lives for those of us that have grown up in and around the church. This model of a full time professional pastor, where your one source of income comes from that, that adds so much pressure, especially when you feel like the church isn't quote unquote winning, like we're not growing, we're not seeing the results that, you know, all the books I've read in the past have told me I should be seeing. So I agree with you, Dale. I think the church of the future is going to look radically different from the church of the past. That's uncomfortable, but it's not bad news. It's good news for those of us leaders who are willing to pivot and adapt and and lean into what the Spirit of God is doing right now in the church. If we're willing to not fight for the rut that we've been in, if we're willing to try to embrace a new season of church— what if what if it didn't look as hard? What if we are overthinking all of this? Yeah. You know, again, what if a pastor's primary role is to go out and support their family, you know, with the majority of their time in the marketplace and they used a small part of their time, you know, leading people? I get it. If you're in a church of 2000, that's probably not a, a good model. But if you're in a gathering of 35 people, it's a very doable model. It's a necessary model. But if that pastor has in in his or her mindset this idea of I'm failing because my church isn't growing past 30 or 40 people. And, you know, I'm trying to justify my full-time position of being here and the money's running out. Like that's just a hard place to be, man. That's a very discouraging place. So again, if, if I could just help take some pressure off of the pastors and say, let's, let's lean into what God is doing right now and be willing to do some things differently. And I know it's easy. One last thing I'll say, and I'll be quiet. I know it's easy to kind of 
criticize the quote unquote institutional church. And I'm not that guy. Like I love the church. I'm a local church guy. Having said that, there are things about the institution that we've inherited that aren't necessarily right or wrong, but we certainly don't need to continue to fight for outdated systems that are no longer working. So there's parts of the institutional church, quite frankly, that need to die. They have not done us well in this new season. They're not, we're not set up to thrive into the future with those old systems. So let's blow them up, you know, and let's start some new systems and and understand we have a lot of permission and freedom to do that. Well, I mean, wasn't even a lot of the guys who wrote the New Testament, weren't they bivocational? Probably. <laughs> well, we know Paul was, <laughs> you know, and, you know, we if we want to be a New Testament church, I'm, I'm just saying. So yeah. for, for you, Greg, what would you what would you answer? What would you define as success and and pastoring moving forward? Mm-hmm. I think for me, and it's always been this way, especially since I think I was I was a lay person for 20 years before I was a pastor, is are we making disciples? Are we making people that are really following Christ? They're living out the Christian life um, to the fullest. And so I look back at some of the churches I've been part of, and I've actually seen lay people do majority of that work. I was part of an adult Bible fellowship one time that had about 100 people in it, where the, the leader discipled a few of us, and we discipled other people. Some small groups started out of it, and people were growing. Uh, in that one class, six people ended up either as missionaries or full-time pastors That's so cool. after That's that. So cool. And so because that layperson had a vision, and the pastoral staff allowed him to do that. And, and they knew what he was doing and they were behind him doing it. And so I think that's, the, to me, that's as a pastor, what I always strive for is, hey, how do I make disciples? And how do I create people that can make disciples that make disciples? And then in that, we also saw that because they were following Christ, they started inviting people to church. It became something mm-hmm. that they were all about. And the church grew through that just through this one class of people that was that were following Christ, making disciples, and inviting people. And I still think to me, that's the model. And I don't think you then have to be full time to do that, right? You can be bivocational in a small church and do those same things. But how do you find that person that that can come alongside you and do that or a couple of people? That's to me, that's the real win. And all I, of it. I want to I want to put a plug in right because I knew how you, I knew what you were going to say because that's your passion. <laughs> but but uh, we had a podcast recently with Derek Sanford. I, it was I think it was like our hundred 53rd podcast. You can go back and look, listen to it. But Derek pastors a church in Erie, Pennsylvania. This is a large, large church. And, and, and the majority of this church is led by volunteers. They, they, the, the, the majority of the staffing of this church, they have paid full-time staff members who were under, uh, as far as the hierarchy and the structure of the church under volunteers. And he, he's a great resource of doing what I think is biblical. And that is equipping the saints to do ministry. So if you're listening to Greg and you're like, oh, yeah, but that can't be done. I'm telling you it's being done. It's not, it, not on the scale. It needs to be, but, but again, as we talk today, and that's the purpose of this podcast, there is a shift happening. And so I wanted to highlight that and I'll put, I'll put, a, I'll put that podcast in the show notes, Brent, how would you define it? What is success in the ministry moving forward? I, I think uh, success first off is um, us going back to the source of who's actually the driving force behind this. And this it's the Lord. And he said that he'd build his church and he is building his church. But sometimes we can, as pastors, start functioning as if we're the ones that are supposed to build his church. Um, and that's that's just simply not what the text teaches. I think if we can get to a place to where we can quit trying to crush it, Um, and just get back to the basics behind why we're even there. Um, Greg, you you hit the nail on the head. Um, If I can look at my week and see see these relationships of effective discipleship, I'm doing the the work of the church then. Uh, If I'm in turn creating leaders, if I'm setting people free to serve within their giftings, within the local church, then I'm uh, then God's building His church, and He's using me as a conduit to do it. But I, I really feel like we have to let go of you know, because I mean, I know especially when I was a young pastor, you know, we were taught that hey, every week you got to hit a home run, yep. and if you don't hit a home run, it's then you're not doing the work of the Lord, every and that is the Bowl. biggest lie that we have bought into for a lot of decades here in North America, and we have a lot of pastors that feel disconnected, discouraged, discouraged and disappointed because they haven't been able to hit home runs. But even when we look at the basic game of, of baseball, 90% of the time it's, it's base hits. 
<laughs> that make it to you. That, that, well, that a, a high got, batting yeah. average is when you we need to, we strike out the least or whatever. <laughs> <You know>? Exactly. <laughs> it, it, exactly. You know. So so if I think we we can get to that place, um, then I I feel like a lot of pastors will feel more encouraged. But then on the other hand, I think a lot of pastors need to actually sit down with their spouses and have some very real conversations about what it would look like to actually do this differently, to go to their church and say, hey, I'm no longer going to be the full-time guy. Hey, this is how, this is, this is how, where I believe the Lord's will. And and all, all of us on this know that some of them will get a pink slip if they do that. Mm -hmm. But the reality is this, if we actually want to embrace this paradigm shift, are you willing to do that hard thing of going back into the marketplace and then doing church differently? Jason, you started this. So I'm going to ask you that question. Same question. What is, what is success in ministry? Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> the guys are, you're all hitting the, around the They're same all hitting thing. home runs. Yeah. Ma making disciples. I mean, that, that literally is the only like direct thing Jesus said to us to do, go make disciples. And you know, now how do you know if you're making disciples that those are, you know, are, are you doing it the right way? Are you building? Those are all questions every, you got to ask within each context of where you're at. But I, I, I think the struggle is right now, it just, you know, as a guy who's in the middle of a church plant, who planted a church 15 years ago, doing another one now, uh, who merged, we, we have a building that we inherited, but it's got a million dollar mortgage. Mm. Well, we, we got to make those payments. And, and there, there's a tension of, we are in between paradigms right now we're stuck with an old paradigm set of bills to pay but the new paradigm is emerging and so you know brent the way you said that of you know, you know taking the risk right of going to the board and saying this or, or setting it out hey this is the way we're going to do ministry and there are consequences you know that's the struggle that I, I think pastors are just afraid to admit out loud is if i really rearrange how i measure things I'm trusting that the board will, and I'm trusting that the financial obligations that we picked up while we were doing church the old way can still be met, or we can come up with a creative way to manage it. Did that hit a nerve with you, John? Yeah, hundred percent. I'm actually, as we speak, typing Jason a private message going, <laughs> Hey, talk to me about that building situation. I have an idea for uh, something that can be done with that facility that will greatly help out with that, uh, with that mortgage. But uh, I'm telling you, man, like I'm, I'm a part of a, another startup called life celebration ministries. That's really built around those major life events of weddings, funerals, and new life celebration. And one of the things we're seeing in this is where churches have an opportunity to turn their facility that in many cases sits empty 98% of the week into a life celebration center. And you start renting that out for weddings, funerals, you have ministry out into the community, but for far too long, again, here's the paradigm shift. Churches, even in that regard, have had all of the hoops that people have to jump through for us to do your wedding or do your funeral. Like you've got to be one of us. You have to believe exactly as we believe. And so if a church is willing to get outside of that box a little bit, I'm not talking about violating their biblical convictions on issues that God has clearly spoken to. But if if they're willing to do that, there are so many creative options for a church to take their facility and turn it into an entrepreneurial blessing instead of just this, you know, arbitrage of a mortgage around their neck. So Brent, um, I'll fire it up on that one too. Brent, dive in right quick before uh, Jason responds. Well, John, I just saw a beautiful example of that when I was in Atlanta, um, to where this this what this facility has daycares, uh, podcast uh, organizations for different people that want to do things in their community, cafes, bookstores. Oh, and by the way, the church happens to meet there. Yep. Um, so I've I've seen it with my own eyes, and it is it can be a beautiful thing. Jason. Uh, yeah. Well. <laughs> We, we are exploring those. I mean, you know, we are trying to manage all that. And, and that's just, I guess that's the point is we have to be willing to reimagine what it looks like to gather, to worship, to make disciples, especially within the context, I think, of less financial resources, less, less paid staff time, and less cultural credibility. And just roll that in to say, we're going to jump into this and we're going to actually believe that God is going to meet our needs and, and we're going to move forward because we're going to do this 
thing that God told us to do of making disciples. And it sounds really good and I can get excited about it, but I still got to, you know, pay the bills at home as well as at church. And that that's where that tension comes in. And part of what I want to do is to be able to walk with pastors in that tension yeah. and, and wrestle with it without trying to say, you have to do it this way, or you have to do it that way. Let's get creative. Uh, that's John. That's why I love the stuff you do. You, you're willing to be creative and think beyond normal stuff. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. We, uh, there's so much we could talk about here, but, but w- what we want you to understand is I, I feel like as we begin to talk to John about the entree pastor idea last year, uh, I believe this is where things are going, whether you want to go there or not. Uh, as far as just the the generations that are rising up underneath, you know, supporting their local church is not always a priority. Now they support, they get in, they get involved, and and they get excited about you know causes, but they don't necessarily follow through with long term giving and that kind of thing. So so some of this may be just giving you permission to explore opportunities because your first priority is your family. Before we run out of time today, though, I do want to ask this question. You know, uh, Jesus told us through his friend Paul in Ephesians that the role of the pastor, very clear of the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher is to equip the saints to do ministry. We talk about it all the time in 95 Network. Greg, I'm going to throw this at you first, so I'll give you a second to figure out uh, what you want to say. But what does it really mean to be an equipper in, you know, in now 2023? What, is that, what does that look like? And, and what I'm looking for here, with, and I'll throw it to all of you, is uh, just what are some practical things that I can do as a leader to be an equipper. Greg, what's your first thoughts there? Yeah, I mean, the first thing that comes to my mind is having some type of a discipleship pathway that you can help take people down, whether that's writing your own curriculum or getting a curriculum to do that. I, I was in contact with a pastor who took over a small church recently, and he, he actually saw the church grow underneath him, but he was very specific on how he did things. The first thing he did was he created an environment of unity So we got all the elders together and said, hey, here's where we all agree we want to go. And here's how I think we should go there. And then they all agreed to that. So to me, you know, how do you create this environment of unity within your elder board? Then after the elders were unified, then they took it out to the staff. And it was a small staff, a couple of people. They were unified. Then they took it to the congregation. And after the congregation, he sat down and taught a discipleship class with a group of people and spread and kind of went out from there. So he had a very specific plan. I think we get creative with a plan like that and we have a good strategy we can move forward with things so you're basically saying they need a clear mission and vision (laughs) yes exactly (laughs) been been known to say that a few times myself john (laughs) John, what does it mean to be an equipper in 2023 well i'm telling you the thing that probably needs to happen step one is that you pastor need to decide and like choose to make the decision that you are no longer going to be the primary ministry provider in your church Hmm. Because until you make that decision, nothing else is going to flow from that. You have to come to this place of deciding, I'm not doing that anymore. It's one of the problems that I see unintended consequences of that full-time pastor model that's that's been very traditional and accepted is that it allows the church people to sit back and say, pastor, that's why we hired you. You're our full-time hired guy. That's why we pay you that big $45,000 annual salary. And uh, we come and watch what you do. Like you do the work, we come and consume it. And so pastor, step one is just deciding not doing that anymore. And then that starts you down the path of, okay, so how do we equip people? Um, How do we start putting the right key people in place? They don't have to be paid staff. You absolutely can build this out with committed volunteers that get more done in a shorter period of time than paid staff do half the time anyway. Ask me how I know I worked in a full-time role for a long time. We had a lot of fun. I'm not saying we were lazy. I'm just saying we had a lot of fun, but our volunteers didn't have the luxury of sitting in a church office for 40 hours a week. There's a lot of wasted time there. I'm not Absolutely. A ton of wasted time. (laughs) Yep. So anyway, pastor, decide you're not doing it anymore. And then, then that'll lead to the next step of how do we begin equipping other people to do the work of ministry. And and part of that, what has to happen there, we were, we're doubling down on this because so many of our pastors define who they are by being a pastor, by being in ministry. And guys, gals and gals, that's not healthy. You, you cannot keep defining your life by being, quote unquote, the man or woman of God. Uh, you know, you, you have a role to play, but it's ultimately Jesus is the one, that, as we've already mentioned, he's the one that's going to grow his church. Uh-huh. Uh, and so, so for Brent, what does it mean to you? What does it mean to be an equipper in 2023? 
Uh, I think, you know, what it means to be an equipper outside of kind of the Sunday school answer that, you know, most of the pastors already know. Uh, I, I think if they can start to view some things differently and apply some very applicable things, like one, uh, if you want to get creative, you need to get around innovators. Um, oftentimes, uh, a lot of pastors find themselves able to commiserate with other pastors that are in the exact same situation. And that is not a breeding ground for innovation, quite honestly. Mm -hmm. um, you need to figure out a way how to surround yourself with innovators that are not only inside the church, but outside of the church. Um, because you would be amazed how contagious creativity then becomes. Um, two, uh, just to piggyback on what John was saying, um, you know, Quit. You have to get out of this mentality that, uh, you know, oftentimes as a dad, I'll find myself in uh, and I'm not saying congregants are like children. Sometimes they are. Sometimes they're not <laughs> sheep, but, sheep. They're called sheep. <laughs> but sometimes saying, well, it's easier if I just do it. Mm -hmm. Is it really? Is it really easier if you just we've been doing that for a long time? So we already know that that has been disproven. So taking a look at the body of Christ that exists within your church and figuring out how to turn them loose, not on not on the big Herkin things necessarily that are sitting in there, because sometimes, yeah, those are more complex. Uh, but what are the things that people can do to become engaged in their church um, that'll make a world of difference, that'll help create even some organic opportunities for discipleship? Um, you know, so, I, I, you know, that's just a few things that I think um, they can they can look at heading into this new year that I I believe would make a world of difference. Jason, what does it mean to be an equipper in 2023? Well, I mean, Greg spun on with, you got to have a clear mission and vision and those expectations of how that gets done have to be very clear and laid out so that everyone can own that and be part of it. Um, I think as a pastor, as an equipper, you've got to be available so that people can actually talk with you. You can't hide in your ivory tower spending all this time studying, planning messages that you're just going to, you know, lay out for everyone and then retreat. You, you've got to actually walk with people and do life with them, which is, you know, whether that's marketplace or, you know, whatever it is, you have to be available. I, I think you got to equip people to think theologically in the context of practicing their giftedness. Ooh. So as they are doing the things that they're good at, you need to equip them to think theologically while doing it and that's part of the equipping as not just equipping them to do you know run powerpoint or pro presenter but equipping them to think theologically around why is it important for people to see these how does this help how do i you know those type things and i think last of all you got to get out of the way and let people do it we, we just hold on to stuff and think we're the only ones that can do it well yeah. you got to stop thinking that and get out of the way we do that a lot of times again because we define who we are by ministry. As we wrap up, I do I, want to help. Yes, they always. One thing I've I've learned, and you, I think you say this in your book as well. Uh, but you know, I found that I need to be needed, and I find my identity. I think you already in being needed, and I, I've got to. I don't care if I go to counseling, whatever it is, I got to get over that if yes. we're going to ever truly shift into this new way of doing ministry the way Jesus wanted us to. One of the things I want to say to you as we, as we move toward the end of the podcast is this, you know, um, for, for so long, we've viewed the people in our congregation as volunteers. Everything's about volunteer, volunteer, volunteer. And, 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 and they are actually priests and Kings, according to the scriptures, they're not there to fulfill your vision. They're not there to uh, be pawns to, you know, to create your serve teams. You need to find their giftedness and release them in the arenas that Jesus, that Father God created them. And it's, it, there's got to be a shift away from, and see, I believe in mission and vision. We all need to be on that same page of what our mission and vision is in our local church. But, but, but it, Mission and vision is not something that you have so you can uh, attract people around you so they can be your serve team and your volunteer team to fulfill your mission or vision. You need to get the bigger mission and vision of what the Lord wants to do in your community and then f to help people find, if you want to be a great equipper, you got to find out where they're passionate. You release them in their arena of their passion, their giftedness, the way that God created them, and you'd be shocked at what people can do. As we wrap up, John, what are your final thoughts about uh, what we've talked about today? And 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 just give us a word of hope for uh, the pastors uh, as they move into this new year. Yeah, that's uh, that resonates with me, Dale. What you just said. So often as pastors, we kind of 
act as though God has uniquely shaped and gifted people perfectly to just work in our nursery at our yeah. church or serve as a first, you know, um, first impressions greeter or whatever. And there's so much more than that. There's so much greater ministry beyond the four walls of the church that they need to be equipped for. So, you know, as we kind of this conversation has morphed into this idea of equipping others around us to do the work of ministry, I just have a free resource if it's okay that I offer this, Dale. Yes, Are you absolutely. good with that? Yes. Absolutely. A while back, m- many years ago, actually, I created a course called How to Hire Staff with No Budget. And we tell the story of how we put those key volunteers in place. I know I just use that word volunteer, but they weren't paid, though. We didn't have the money in a, as a small rural church to pay staff, but we needed people that were gifted and qualified to carry significant weight in our ministry. And we did that. We were able to build out a team of engaged active volunteers. And I just put a little course together outlining how we did that and how you can do something similar in your church. So if anyone's interested in that, if you just shoot me an email, john at 95network.org, I'll be happy to just give that to you at no charge. I'll put that in the show notes too. And even if if there's a link to to either to that or to you, Uh, what about you, Brent? Oh my. Um, I I think one thing that pastors could uh, be encouraged about this year is, um, just view it as an opportunity to engage in with engage with what the Lord's already doing. Yep. Uh, because the reality is um, even with th- the best laid plans, it, it we don't control it. it. Um, we, 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 we just don't. Um, and, and with that said, I think we can actually find hope in this reformation that's taken place that we are actually in a really exciting time. Mm -hmm. Um, to do some things differently, to reach new generations that are not little kids, but full grown adults Mm -hmm. um, that are out there with creative ways that we can actually engage in our communities. Um, So, you know, one practical thing, actually, that I'd like to give pastors that are listening to this, it's something that I've started doing every day, is I wake up in the morning, and before I come down the steps, I literally say out loud, kind of bit of whisper because I don't want to wake my six-year-old. Today, I'm going to choose joy. Mm. Today, I'm going to choose joy, regardless of whatever what I'm facing, the good and the bad. I'm just going to choose joy because it's in Jesus. Mm. And then I go down the steps and I start my day. And I think pastors, they need to do that. Don't wake up and just be overwhelmed with all these different things that we've talked about coming at you. Start with joy first so before good. you go down your steps or step out of your room. Greg? Yeah, I would just encourage pastors. I think the most exciting thing for me as a pastor is to see people using their gifts in the way God intended them to use them and making imp- impact for the kingdom. Mm-hmm. And you can just sit back and just watch what God does to those people. And that's where you're really going to get peace and joy and know that God is using you uh, through those people. So that'd be my encouragement. Jason? Hi. I would, you know, two things. First of all, don't be afraid to get help. Yeah. Whether it's reaching out to 95 Network or, you know, some local people that, you know, that you can just brainstorm and you can talk and you can share. So don't be afraid to get help. And I, I think, Greg, you're, you're touching on something really important. Just love your people. Just love them. D- and let that guide the decisions you make, the way you go about doing it. I, we're so worried about, you know, everything being high level, this high look. Just love your people. And I think God will reward that. I want anyone listening to know that if you want to talk to any of these guys, they're totally available at any point in time. I will include everyone's email uh, on the on the show notes. But please, if you need help, reach out to us. If you if you and one of the most important things that I heard today was, you, you know, you if you're going to be innovative, you got to get around innovative people. You know, if you're going to be a disciple, you got to get around disciple people. You know, you you become who you hang around, basically. And so uh, we offer what we do at 95 Network to encourage, strengthen, and support uh, the small and the mid-sized church. And no matter how you define it, you know, whether it's, you know, above 250 or whatever it is, the reality is, is you're still an individual pastor that we love and we want, we're, we believe your best days are ahead. Uh, the reformation that we're experiencing is not a negative thing. It's an awesome thing. So thank you guys uh, so much for taking your time to share uh, with the pastors today, being on the podcast, and we know it's going to help a lot of folks. Um, so guys, uh, have a have have a great week and and for you and your ministries i hope this is a great new year for you too thanks for listening to the 95 podcast we look forward to sharing another episode with you next week in the meantime visit our website at 95network.org 
The website is loaded with great resources created for small and mid-sized church leaders. Until next time, have a great week.